Everyone wants to be successful, and there's nothing wrong with having ambition, or is there? Today, His Eminence Bishop Omega answers this question and many others in a sermon titled, How to Be Successful in the Eyes of God. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peace be unto you all and praise the Lord. I would like to talk to you about how it is to be a success in the eyes of God. And the actual title is, How to Be Successful in the Eyes of God. And we're going to use a passage of scripture, which we've been over many times, but with a focus now, with primarily four areas we're going to focus on. And since we're talking to and about and for young people, this is the Young People's uh, Conference and the Little Flocks Conference. Our, and Jesus, in our particular passage today, uses a little one to make his point. I thought it was very uh, apropos that we use this particular passage to bring out the word today. And since we're uh, vibing off of or borrowing from Mother Boswick and the theme that she, that they've come up with for the little flock, building little believers up in the ways of Jesus, this is not only applicable for little ones, but it's for all of us in general, for those of us who are disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for us to listen to the admonition, the teaching, the warnings, and the, the, the uh, lessons in the word. We have to pay attention and pay, pay strict attention to our four points today that we're going to draw out and, and uh, hopefully will be clear to you all, little ones and for the more mature audience. But today, or this evening, I'd like to use um, in Mark a passage from Mark 30. But before we get to it, as I say, Mark the ninth chapter, 30th verse, we're going to start. But before we get to it, a little background. We are coming off of uh, the events of the transfiguration, the holy transfiguration on the mountain. Remember Jesus called aside three special ones to go up with him, three of the group, Peter, James, and John, came down the mountain, healed the demon-possessed boy, and then he foretold of his own demise, his own death, and yet, this is why this is not just for little ones, it's for all of us, to pay attention to what it's like to be successful in the eyes of God to be pleasing to God. And yet, Jesus talked about his death. Jesus just came off of the Mount of Transfiguration that the three of them saw him in his glory with Moses and Elijah. He came down the mountain, healed the demon-possessed boy, right? You would think these things would be on their mind, but instead on the road the disciples had on their mind, as Jesus so aptly put out, uh, brought out by uh, asked, questioning them, what were you talking about when you were on the road? They were concerned with things of the nature that speaks to one's ambition, which is nothing wrong with us being ambitious. God put that in us. The thing is, what kind of ambition do we have? Now, they were arguing among themselves about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. But see, that is a need for the, to satisfy the human desire to be the best at something. But guess who put that in us? God put that in us. It's nothing wrong to be ambitious. Nothing wrong with being successful. The want to do things the best and all that sort of thing, that's fine. God put that in us. But the, the problem is, it's all right to be ambitious, but you have to be ambitious for the right reasons. And that's what Jesus brings out here. So that's why I titled this, How to Be a Success in the Eyes of God. When we live our lives, we achieve things and we do things and many of us want to be applauded by humans, by men. When I say applauded, I mean recognized, given uh, recognition, uh, 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 fame, uh, even remuneration, whatever. We like human beings to recognize our greatness. But it's all right to want to be great at something, but for the right reasons. And that's what, you notice Jesus never rebuked them for having ambition, for wanting to be great. We've been over this before, but for our young people today and for us in general, let us go over this timeless lesson where we learn what it is like to please God in the way we are in our lives. And Jesus highlights, if you, if you will, gives us four particular points I'd like to bring out today in just a few scriptures. We're in Mark the ninth chapter. We're gonna begin at the 33rd verse. And we're going to see something here. Four points we're going to pay attention to, to see what the Lord is teaching us. What is important to God? You want to be applauded by God or applauded by men? You want to be a success in the eyes of God or a success only in the eyes of men? 
If in the eyes of men you're interested in being a, a success that's not very Christ, Christian, not very Christ-like, but we're going to see here what's important to God because Jesus brings it out very poignantly. Now, the thing to notice is, <clears throat> as I said earlier, he did not rebuke them for having ambition. But what he did was honed in or focused where their ambition should, should, ambition should be. And he shows us what it is like in the thinking, in the mind of God for those who claim to love him. You should want to be what it is he sees as successful. And when he refocuses his own disciples' attention, I think we can learn from this that he's speaking to us as well. So for the, and notice I said he picks up a little child to make this point, so that's why I thought it was appropriate to address the little flock as well as the young people in general and the, the congregation in general. This is not just a lesson for little flock. This is not just a lesson for young people. It's a lesson for Christians. And I again will remind us of the little flock's thing, building up, building little believers up in the ways of Jesus, very apropos um, title for their conference, and I thank the Lord for it. We're going to begin here then at the 33rd verse of the ninth chapter of Mark, and please pay attention to the admonitions in the word, the teachings in the word. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, again, the house implies, that's a definite article, the house, not an house or a house, but the house, which means it's probably the one he went to most often, which means it's probably Peter's house. It's not said there dogmatically, but most likely it was Peter's house, the main place where they met in Capernaum. And he asked, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? What were you all arguing about on the road? Now, Jesus had a clue because he could probably detect or discern from their demeanor that something was not so straight here among them. Why? First of all, when Jesus called up three to the mountain to witness the transfiguration, they didn't know what they were going up for, but notice he told them, he told them, do not tell anyone about this until later. So on the way back, I'm sure the other disciples were saying, hey, to Peter, James, and John, what happened up there? Now, this is human, be human nature to want to be the great, because it says they were arguing, we'll see in a minute, they were arguing who's going to be the greatest. So I'm sure these three probably came down and said, well, we can't tell you what went on up there. This could have, listen to me clearly, saints, this could have sparked that human reaction, you can't tell us why. why. Why aren't we good enough to know? Why did you three go up and not we others, not we other nine? Can't we know what happened? So on the road, an argument ensued about who's the greatest. It could be from their demeanor. Now, there's a way you can say, we can't tell you, and there's a way you can say, we can't tell you because it's only for we three special ones. Who knows? But somehow you can, you're going to see clearly an argument broke out on the road. And with these three that were allowed to go up to the mountain, arguing that who's the greatest came up somewhere, and it could have come from the fact that these three said, well, we can't tell you. So the others are thinking, well, are we less than you? Perhaps, perhaps this could have happened. But notice what Jesus says here, what the word says here. What was it you disputed among uh, yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed or argued among themselves who would be the greatest. Jesus does not get on them, if you notice, for having the desire to be the best at something, to be the greatest, but he wants to refocus. Now, He's, and he sat down, Jesus, called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. That was a quick lesson in ambition is fine, but the kind of ambitious individual that pleases God is not one who says, How many servants do I have? How great am I? But how many people do I serve? Notice what he just said. Jesus is saying, I know what you all are arguing about, and here is my redress to that. You fellows want to be my prime minister, the number one minister in the kingdom. You want to be the secretary of uh, foreign affairs, the, this and that, the, the greatest of great. Jesus says, let me tell you what true greatness is, what's pleasing, what's successful in the eyes of God. The one whose mind says, not how many serve me, not how much do I have, 
not how much have I accomplished personally, but how many do I serve? How many to whom do I give? How many do I give? How many do I uplift? How, this is the true greatness in the eyes of God. And please teach our young people, and not just our young, all of the saints, but since this is the, the conference of the young people and the uh, con conference of the little flock, let us talk to them specifically. In rearing them, teach them there's nothing wrong with having ambition, nothing wrong with wanting to be great. But notice what our Lord said here in just a few words. Discerning what they were arguing about, because they all kept silent when he said, what were you all arguing, disputing on the road? They all kept silent because they felt guilty, knowing uh, I was rather selfishly uh, ambitious there, because I wanted to be the greatest, he wanted to be the greatest. I, so they were arguing, Jesus said, detected that. He says, let me tell you all something, and let me amplify what he, let me tell you something. You want to be great? You want to be a success? Don't worry about human beings recognizing your greatness. Do what is great in the eyes of God. And he says, in these very few words, and notice he sat down, called the twelve to him, and he says, if any of you, if anyone desires to be first, first is another way of saying the greatest, the best at something. You want to be the best? You want to be my prime minister, my first minister? Then you should be last of all and servant of all in your mind. And if, you, if you're like that in your mind, that will be exemplified in your behavior. You, you think something first and then you do it. So if you're thinking, let me serve others, let me help others, you will help others. You will serve others. Jesus wants to bring that home to them that the world looks at success one way, God looks at and applauds success in another way. Let me ask you, are you uh, desirous to be applauded by God or do you want the accolades and applaud of men only, human beings only? If so, then you're not thinking like Christ. And since, as the little flock theme is, building little believers up in the, name, in the ways of Jesus, it is important to us that we show them the mind of Jesus when they're little. So as they grow up, they will learn that true greatness is service to others. True greatness is not being um, applauded so much by human beings, but being applauded by God in that you serve other human beings. If they happen to recognize you and happen to applaud you, fine. If you get recognition from uh, others, from human beings, fine. But whenever, and especially when you're doing service for the church, when you're doing, or but service in general, but especially for the church, you should never do it. First of all, grudgingly, never do it grudgingly, but never do it with the idea that I hope they recognize me one day. If you're doing it with the right heart, you don't mind being last of all and servant of all. You don't mind being unrecognized for what you do because you know it is being recognized by the one that really matters. These lessons are very important. So in our first lesson, I said we have four points to bring out today. The first thing here is to not to want to uh, uh, exalt yourself, but to serve others. And Jesus brings home this point by doing what he does next. Listen to this. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. Jesus is going to illustrate what he just said. Now, why does he use a little child? Well, first of all, little flocks conference, so let's use a little child here. Jesus brings a little child to show this little individual can in no wise help me, pay me back, or applaud me in any kind of way. A little child is only dependent. Notice it says a little child. He can't uh, do anything for me. He only needs things done for him. Jesus is showing, but by using this little child, sitting in the middle, says, when he had taken him in his arms, so Jesus obviously took the little kid, put him in his arms, the child in his arms, and he said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me only, he means, but him that sent me. Now, let's load it. What Jesus just said there is, this is the first thing we're focusing on, to really be great is to help the seemingly unimportant. A ch child in, among the, uh, the human families, unimportant in that they can't do anything for themselves. They can't pay you back if you do something for them. They only need care. So he's not just talking about a child. Those in society who can't pay you back, 
who are in the most need. They need, they, they have a, a desire, or they have a need that has to have their, has to, has to be met by others. They can't do it themselves, nor can they repay you once you've done something for them. Not a little child. The only way they repay you is with more need. Even when you feed a child, you have to clean up after the child. So Jesus' point is, learn to think like he does. He says, I and master of you all in another place, and yet I'm here as a servant. Let us never forget what he did in the upper room. He got up and did the lowliest, menial job of all, to clean the feet of others. And Jesus is saying, if this mind is not in you, are you really my disciple? So here in this first uh, section, we're learning that to receive the seemingly unimportant one, such as a child, but anybody in society that is childlike, in need, of assistance, in need of help, to receive that person. And look at this very important thing he said, in my name. Now, what does that mean? Whenever you help or do something for someone for the sake of Jesus, doing it because I love Jesus, I'm a follower of his, I belong to him. He's going to use those very words later, because you belong to me. Understand something, saints. Jesus sees no difference in helping him or helping one of his followers. He says it's the same. And that's very important to us. If we learn to think like that, you'll treat your brothers and sisters differently. You're treating, you're feeding, you're helping, you're clothing Jesus. He didn't say it's like helping me. He said it is helping me. In that you fed one of these, in that you've done this, you've done it to the least of them, he says, you've done it unto me. He didn't say like doing it unto me. That's how Jesus sees us, as himself. That's how God the Father sees us, as Jesus. That's why he can count us as justified and saved. You have to come to this thinking. If we don't teach this to our little ones, when they are little, if we don't exemplify this in ourselves, among each other, then why are we really Christians? And what are you doing, mocking time here? I mean, you, you can't fool God, so stop fooling yourself. You're either in his camp, in his thinking, in that mindset, or you're in the other one, and you don't want to be in that one. Jesus just said here that if anyone wants to be important, you want to be first, then consider yourself last, and don't mind being last. In fact, always be ready to serve others. It, it, it gets to me sometimes when I'm trying to help or do something, and someone has always uh, taken, and I understand it though, it's out of love, Someone's always saying, oh, let me get that for you, Bishop. Let me that. I'm saying, I want to do this service. I want to help brother so-and-so sit down. I want to help mother do this. I want to. Because I'm not putting on, I'm not faking, I really want to serve. And I know that it does reflect our Lord Jesus. It reflects his mind. If, I think this is perhaps one reason the Lord has given me such a life that Nothing, and I often say this, I don't know if people understand me, nothing really impresses me in the materialistic sense. Now, the, maybe the Lord did that so I can now, at this point in my life, teach it with sincerity, but you can't impress me with jewels, money, houses, yachts, uh, countries, anything. What I would like to do now is exemplify the Lord Jesus every day that I can, because I know what this life has to offer, and it's not much, it's only temporary. But I know what's lasting, what's real joy, what pleases God, and what will not make me lose my reward, that is to say my special position, my special service in the eternal kingdom. He's going to refer to that too. I don't lose that reward when I exemplify Christ in my daily living, in my daily giving, in my daily loving, in my daily forgiving. This is all Christ-like. And when, as Jesus said, if to receive someone in his name, the seemingly most unimportant person in society, such as a little child. But please don't take everything so literally and then full stop. A little child can also re be representative of the helpless person in the community, the helpless person in your household, in your society. But he's saying to receive someone in, for, in by name, for my name's sake. Didn't I say oftentimes, sometimes you'll tell someone, don't do this, and they don't leave this on the floor, and they do it anyway, and you say, I'm not picking up after this prayer. I told them over and over. You ever in your mind say, let me just clean up. 
let me just do it anyway for Jesus' sake. If you haven't come to that thinking yet, not still with an attitude, I'm doing it for Jesus' sake, not for you. No, no, you have to say, let God get the glory here. Don't you know, don't we, we should all know by now, and we're going to get to this too, that sufferings and persecutions are the things that refine and preserve us. They, they make us ready for the kingdom. They purify us. These things are put, like some of your suffering in life, they, these things are put there for a purpose, to praise God, to, uh, that others may see you still praising God even though you're suffering. So selfless service to others, and especially the helpless in society, these things are godly to do. And we should never forget that. Let's hone in on and focus on what Jesus thinks is important. And at this particular uh, youth conference and this uh, young people's, what do you call it, Little Flocks Convention uh, conference, let us keep this in mind to instill this in them while they're young. And let them see by example that we serve others. I don't care what your position is. All right, I'm bishop. So what? Let me do this when I want to do this. I get it. Being served is an honor. I get that. But Jesus says, I am first among you, speaking of himself, and first among you, yet you see me serving you. He says, so what I do, he says, do this always. And people, again, taking Jesus incorrectly, thinking he meant literally keep on washing each other's feet. Nothing wrong with washing each other's feet when it's practical. But he was saying, like, like people took most of his miracles incorrectly or put the wrong emphasis on them. Jesus was not so concerned with, with a, a foot hygiene as much as he was learn to take low and serve one another, even doing the most menial tasks for one another. That's the lesson in there. And that's what our first lesson here in this passage today is, all right, you want to be great at something? Ambition's fine. But learn to hone your ambition in the, uh, in the right uh, perspective, in the right way. Learn to do it by serving others. Be ambitious by serving others. Be greatest by being least among your brethren, by serving them. Don't worry, you won't lose your reward, your special service and place in the kingdom. God won't forget what you've done. Who cares whether other human beings recognize you or not? Sometimes, you know, they have um, employee appreciation day and everyone loves that. Got it. But we as Christians, if no one ever lauds you, as I say, compliment you for what you do, for what you've done, keep it moving if you're doing it for the if you're serving it if you're doing it in the name of Jesus for my name's sake if you're doing it in the name of Jesus you know the most important one took note already and then you keep on doing it and you're inspired to continue to do it because I'm doing it for God I'm doing it for Jesus and for the right reasons that's our first uh, uh, admonition here in the word when you uh, serve others do it in the name of Jesus and always be keen to serve the most helpless among you. So he uses a little child. And don't forget all of what I'm about to go through in these verses today, he has the little child in his hand. Now, and he's doing that on purpose. It says Jesus sat. So since he's seated, the child is probably now on his lap, but he's holding him. Or he could have picked him up and been holding him here, depending on how little the child was. We don't know. But clearly he's holding the, the child all through what we're going through today. Keep that in mind. Why is he doing that? He's showing you, look at this little helpless one. Unless you serve this little helpless one, unless you come as this little helpless one to God, unless you are like this with one another, innocent as a child with one another, loving, then you're not really getting the message in the, in the word here. Then he took the little child, verse 36, and set him in the midst of them, right in the middle of all the disciples who were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. So Jesus, in his clever way, picks up the most helpless one in that group, in the house, most likely Peter's house. So it could have been Peter's son. We don't know. It was some unnamed child that was in the house, definite article, in Capernaum. And he's showing them, I know you all were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And you have ambition. Nothing wrong with it. But Focus your ambition in the right direction. Have the right kind of ambition. Have the ambition to serve others and willingness to be last. Let the other person get the last word in. Who cares? 
You do the service in the name of Jesus. Serve others in the for the sake of Jesus. That's all that means, in the name of Jesus, for his sake, on his behalf. And when he had taken the little child in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. Now look at this uh, lesson also. When you do this, Jesus says, when you receive him in my name, you're not only serving that child, not only serving Jesus, Jesus says you're even serving God the Father, the one who sent him. So you see that true and selfless service to others is truly serving God. How can you help God? What does God need? Well, he needs you to serve one another. And Jesus says in doing that, and especially, especially serving the most helpless, the most vulnerable, you're not only doing it in Jesus' name, you're not only receiving, accepting, he says receives, you're not only accepting in Jesus' name, but you're also accepting or receiving or doing service for God, the Father. Listen to this. Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, receives Jesus. He didn't say like receiving me. He said, you receive me. You're helping, you're accepting, you're doing service to Jesus. And he says, furthermore, not that only, whoever receives me receives not me only, he's saying, but him, the Father who sent me. So we see in that first lesson that uh, to receive the seemingly unimportant one is not only receiving or helping or accepting that little one, but it's re accepting, receiving, and helping Jesus. Yea, it even goes as far as helping God the Father himself. Directly. Jesus said it. You can't dispute it. And our, we move on now to our second point. John, now John answered him saying, now notice what John says. Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow with us casting out demons in your name. Why do you think John said that? Because Jesus just said about doing something in my name. So John's thinking, all right, in your name. We just saw someone casting out demons in your name, but he doesn't sit with us. He doesn't come to our church. He doesn't hang out with us. We don't know him, but he was doing it using your name, in your honor, with your, uh, the power of your name. This is what John noticed. In my name, John says, okay, I have an in my name question for you, Jesus. He says, we saw someone who does not follow with us casting out demons in your name, and we told him to stop it. We forbade him because he, why? He doesn't sit in our church, doesn't come with us. This is a very important lesson here. Here's our second lesson. In, when someone is working on behalf of, recognizing, working on behalf of, or recognizing, honoring Jesus, working on behalf of, recognizing, honoring Jesus, yet you don't seem, to, you don't know them personally, and they may not have everything right about the nuances of the gospel. But clearly there's a love for Jesus here. And I say this, and let me extrapolate. Even people whose lifestyles may not be all there, but something about them, they're showing this love for Jesus. I want you to pay attention to what our Lord is teaching here. And they're doing it, and God is granting, obviously, this person to cast out demons in his name. So God is clearly allowing this person their love for Jesus, their recognition of Jesus. And I'm saying this because don't just take what Jesus says here and, and just keep it in that little box that you see on these pages. Extrapolate, take it a little further. And not that you're adding to the word, but apply what he's saying beyond what you see here on the pages because that's what the word does. Don't forget the word of God is deep. And it goes beyond often what you just see written in this particular passage. Let me finish the rest of it so you'll see what I'm saying. But Jesus said, do not forbid him, for no, for no one works a miracle in my name, no one who works a miracle in my name, can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. What did Jesus just say there? Well, what I was, about, what I was alluding to. Even when someone may not have everything just like they should, their lifestyle may be questionable in many areas, and I won't get too detailed, but you can use your own minds. But something about them, they love Jesus. Notice Jesus threw in, they can't soon afterwards speak evil of me. We have to listen to what he's saying there. This person, in some way, yearns for, respects, loves, uh, desires, honors Jesus. 
Jesus is saying, even though everything about them may not be just like what you're used to, they may not be fully grown in the knowledge of the gospel, but something about them is pulling toward me, Jesus, that is to say. And Jesus is saying, they can soon speak ill of me, meaning don't take it lightly that they love me because that is enough to make you have patience with this person. And I like this general uh, word here. If they're not against us, Jesus says, count them as, they're for us. Look at this, for he who is not against us is on our side. Jesus just gave us a broad swath, if you will, of area, of cloth, of it, to include people that you may not fully understand, but one thing they do is honor that name of Jesus. And that's one thing you have to give certain people of other religions, other monotheistic religions, and some who are not monotheistic, believing in one God. When they honor Jesus, I'm not saying turn to that religion. I'm not saying all about that religion is correct. I'm not saying that religion is the way to eternal life. But if they're honoring Jesus, we have to slow down and come back to this admonition here in the word. Jesus is saying, if God is working in the person who is working in my name, leave them alone. He's also saying, notice he said, if they're not against us, count them as for us. If the person is not actively against Jesus, why don't we try this, young people? Why don't we try this, saints of God? Why don't we try this, disciples of Jesus Christ? Back off them. Because that person won't soon speak evil of Jesus, meaning... Jesus is saying there's something in them that where they find me, Jesus, attractive. Jesus said, they're not against me. Leave them alone. Let us remember that. Now, I don't want you to walk away from here thinking, Bishop Omega is saying that other religions are fine. You can get eternal life. Did I ever say that? No. But I'm, what I'm, if, if you listen, what I'm saying, to honor Jesus in a certain way that is real, the person's full belief system may not be correct. Their practices may not be correct. Something may be wrong with their lifestyle. I am not saying join them in their error. Join them in their wrong ways. I'm not saying that. But even the Lord himself here is saying the power of loving him or searching, groping, trying to come to him. He said, leave that person alone. They're not against us. Count them as for us. Count them on our side. I hope you understand that that's, that's a, a pa passage of scripture which I know the hard line is going, no, they're not like Jesus. They all belong in hell. That's not what Jesus said. Listen to what he says again. Do not forbid the person that was doing something in my name because obviously if they're doing it in my name, God has allowed it. And then he goes on to say, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. And the thought there is that if someone is yearning toward, giving the proper honor to Jesus, kind of back off them, leave them alone. Because he, he concludes, he makes that point by saying, for he who is not against us, that's broader than just doing a miracle. Jesus said, he who is not against us, count him as for us. He's on our side. Now, in that is implicit that the person genuinely wants Jesus, genuinely is interested in honors, loves, uh, want, in some way desires Jesus. Jesus is saying if that person is genuine, they won't easily turn against me. And if they're doing a miracle in my name, clearly God is working it. But then he said, let me get more general. If they're not against us, you see them honoring me in some way, Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, hey, Mr. Self-Righteous, back off. No, I am not saying join another faith, another religion, not at all. Neither is Jesus, because he's going to make it clear about the warnings of hell. But let, let's go on. For who, now, here's the, that was the second, the second section that we learned there was, if someone may not be doing things just like you, but they're honoring Jesus, back off. For the power of loving Jesus is greater than your self-righteousness to condemn that person, because everything they do is not like you like you're, what you're used to, they don't sit with you, as John said, in your name, because he came off of the, uh, in your name, he said in my name in verse 37, so John says, all right, let's use that in your name. We saw someone doing miracles in your name. We told them to stop, because they don't sit with us. Jesus said, let me be even more general. If they're not against us, leave them alone, John. 
remember that, saints. Now, we are tolerant of people that may have a wrong lifestyle, that may have a wrong way, but we are always keen to guide them and show them toward the right way. We are not in any way saying accommodate sin. No, what Jesus is saying is stop being such a hardliner, you trying to throw everybody in hell because they don't do things like you think they should. Right? That's our second lesson today. And our third lesson, an area of focus here today is the slightest, the slightest of service or ministry that one does in the name of Jesus for his sake, that's all that means, the slightest ministry is seen as something good in God's eyes. You want to be a success in God's eyes or a success in the eyes of men? Well, to be successful in God's eyes, uh, in our third uh, lesson here today, what we're pulling out of the, what we, in the, our fishing expedition here, what we're getting out of the word that's not necessarily on the surface there, he uses a, a cup of water, the smallest service, the slightest ministry to help someone in, in the name of, for the sake of Jesus, in my name, Jesus said, for whosoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, anyone that helps one of his disciples in for the sake of, in the name of Jesus, because you belong to Christ. Look at that reason. Just because you belong to Christ. Verily I say to you, he, you, shall by no means lose your reward. Meaning, when you help somebody, in the name of Jesus, however small that ministry, that service, that help is, you as a disciple of Jesus, helping another disciple of Jesus, you will not lose, what is he saying? You will not lose your reward. He means in the eternal kingdom, you will have your certain service, your special place. You won't lose it. He's just assuring you, do these things. Do the slightest ministry. In the name, for the sake of Jesus, he says, you're going to be blessed, putting it simply. That's our third lesson that we're learning here today. The slightest thing you can do. Now, why did he use drink of water? That's about the, the least... Uh, amount of exertion you can do to help somebody. Give them some water. Now, of course, you can do bigger things. That would be even better. But his point is, if you're doing something for his sake to help somebody else, as a believer, when he says you will not lose your reward, obviously he's talking to someone who's going to be in the eternal kingdom who has a reward coming. He's saying your position, your service in the kingdom won't in any way be uh, lessened. You will maintain, you will have your place, your reward, your service, your special recognition in the kingdom. So there's another thing for us to, uh, to teach our young ones, how to serve, how to be successful in God's eyes. Do the slightest thing to help someone else. And don't leave it there because if your spirit is right, you want to do more than just the slightest thing. He was letting you know that any little thing that you do for my name's sake, just because you love me, Jesus is saying, to help someone else. Jesus said, you will in no wise lose what's coming to you in the kingdom. Now, is that the only reason that I do uh, good to other people for the name of Jesus? That's enough, isn't it? For the sake and name of Jesus, to honor him. Do you see, do you see a theme here follow, or following here? The importance here is to keep Christ as the focus for whatever it is you do. Whether it is serving others, consider yourself least. Why? Christ knows what you're doing. He'll reward you in due course. And when it comes to stopping somebody who you don't seem to understand, what was our second lesson? Don't forbid them that they're not against us. Leave them alone. Clearly, they love Jesus. Clearly, God is working with the person if they're honoring Jesus. Everything might not be right about their lifestyle. Everything's not right about yours. But guess what? When Jesus is that focus, when Jesus is in it all day, all night, Everything you do, keep Jesus in it. Jesus says, they're not against us, calamus for us. And then he goes on, and the third point we just made is, if you do the slightest ministry to help someone else, it's a good thing in the eyes of God, to sum it up. Now, let's come to our fourth and final, and this is probably the largest section, but also this, if you will, is a warning about hell. Before I even get to it, let me just say this. Jesus spoke of hell more than any other New Testament writer. Did you know that? And he spoke of hell more than he spoke of heaven. Did you know that? 
Why does he do that? Because it is important not to go there. And Jesus makes it very clear the things that can get you there. Turning someone from Jesus. Punishment's coming. Uh, turning against, uh, from Jesus after having been exposed to and invited by and welcomed and called by and to reject Jesus. These things put you in hell. So when we go from verses now 42 through 50, you're going to see him talking about, really in a, in a general way, a uh, warning about don't mess up. Don't mess up. And now that we're, don't forget, Jesus still has that little one in his arms. So the focus here is, and since we're at the convention of the young people and the con conference of the co youth conference and the conference of the little flock, let us keep that focus in mind here. The most helpless among us, the little ones among us, and we're teaching them. We are, what, what are the little flocks, what is their theme? Building little believers up in the ways of Jesus. Some of us are sitting here as grown adults, but are really little ones who still need to be built up in the ways of Jesus. Because sometimes the way you treat one another is anything but grown up in Christ. And where you should now be teachers, you have need to still be taught the very principles of being a Christian. And here we're going to see Jesus takes painstaking efforts to warn people to stay out of hell. Don't do something that will get you cast into uh, that place that you do not want to be for eternity. He goes on in verse 42, and this is our final um, admonition in the Word today in terms of how to be a success in the eyes of God. Well, you don't want to be in hell. That's not a success in the eyes of God. It's a great failure. Here's what you want to do. You want to avoid uh, making others to fall away from the faith or to stumble because of you concerning Jesus or the faith. He puts it this way, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, that means to fall away, to get messed up concerning the truth. Whoever causes one of these, and don't forget he still has a child in his arms. If you cause one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for, the, for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. What did he just say there? It is better to suffer an excruciating natural death than to end up in hell. If you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it's better if you, you know the, the, the big millstone, the one the donkeys pulled? He said, it'd be better if you tied one of those around your neck because you can't, you know, it's going to pull you down. He said, it'd be better if you had a hor horrible, gruesome, that was a Gentile way of killing people, by the way. He says, so it's better to experience a horrible death than to meet what's coming to anyone who causes somebody to stumble away from Christ. And he goes on this way. Uh, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Is he talking uh, physical mutilation here? No. He's saying be serious with yourself. If, now the hands implies what you do. Things, these are the things you use to do things with, right? So he's saying what you do in life, if that causes you to go to hell, stop doing it. He puts it at the graphic terms of better to cut off your hands. Let me put it this way. If your hand, let me read the scripture, verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It would be better to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands and to go to hell into the fire uh, that shall never be quenched. Now, why did I say that he's talking about eternal life here? Because the comparative is hell. So if he's talking about eternity somewhere, hell, then he's talking about life somewhere, eternal life. So he says it's better, listen to what he's saying, it's better to go into eternal life maimed rather than to go into hell doing what you want to do with two hands. Simply put, do not do anything that will cause you to end up in hell, but be very severe with yourself to make sure you have eternal life. That's all Jesus is saying there. Then he goes on to be graphic by saying, their worm, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He's talking about hell. Then he says, and if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Again, he's not talking about physical mutilation. And this is where people often took what he said literally or incorrectly. Sometimes he was speaking literally. Oftentimes he was speaking uh, metaphorically. Here he is. He is saying, if your foot causes you to uh, sin, cut it off. What does he mean? Well, the foot implies your path, where you walk. 
if where you're going is going to cause you to end up in hell, he says, cut off your foot. Now, if we have little children listening. No, mom and dad, tell the little child, Bishop is not, Jesus is not saying either to hurt yourself physically. He is saying, be very severe with yourself and your lifestyle. Your hands, watch what you do in life. That's all he's saying. Here, watch where you go in life, your path in life. He says, it would be better for you to enter life, eternal life, maimed, rather than having two feet be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's fancy language without getting sidetracked with that. He's just saying, don't go to hell doing what you want to do, following the wrong path. The first one, he says, don't let what you do get you into hell doing the wrong things. Look at the third example he uses here. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Leave your eyes alone. No physical mutilation is being advised here. What he is saying, see the eye is considered that which sees. So it's, it's connoting here thought, what you see, what you understand. If what you're seeing, if the way you're viewing things in life will cause you to go to hell, he says pluck your eye out. He does not in any way refer to physical mutilation as something you should literally do. Let's please understand that so when the little children hear this, or younger people, or adults who take things literally or out of context, when you hear this, he is not saying in any way to harm yourself physically. He is saying be so severe with yourself that you don't end up lost. That's what Jesus is saying. So he uses the hand, what you do, the foot, the path you take, and the eyes, what you see, the way you think. He's saying, have them under control so you don't end up in hell. You want to please God? You want to be a success in God's eyes? End up in heaven and not in hell. And let us teach that to our young people. Let us teach that to one another. And another thing, don't forget this too. Before you, since he still has a little child here, before you try to start helping other people, what did he say in Matthew 7, 3, and 4? Before you try to help somebody else, Get that plank, that big log out of your eye first before you try to get that speck out of your brother's eye. Now you can see clearly to help someone else. So here we're talking about helping someone else, bringing them to, don't discourage them from coming to Jesus if you cause them to stumble, if you're gonna help somebody else. But before you can help somebody else, what must you do? Be very severe with yourself. So watch what you do, watch your path in life, watch how you think. Straighten yourself up first before you start trying to help others. Even in the airport or the airliners, don't they tell you put your mask on first before you try to help somebody else put their mask on when uh, you're losing pressure? So the idea Jesus is saying here, get yourself together and be very severe with yourself in terms of hold yourself to a high standard. And he concludes here by using salt and fire. Again, I said this is an allusion to suffering and persecution. Now why? Because in the Old Testament sacrifice system, uh, the, the sacrifices were often associated with fire and, of course, salt. So Jesus is saying here, be very uh, stern with yourself, and that thing which preserves you, the word or purifies you, the word salt, the word, let that be in your life working. He puts it this way as we conclude now. In fact, let me read all of verse 37, uh, 47. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. For it is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hell fire where, again, he repeats, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be seasoned with fire or salted with fire. What does he mean by that? Everyone is going to be purified. Everyone is going to be challenged. Everyone is going to be tested. Those of you that are going to be saved, you're going to be tested with suffering and persecution. But that refines you, that preserves you, it gets you ready for the kingdom. He says everyone will be salted with fire or tested with fire. And every sacrifice will be salted or seasoned with salt. Now listen to this, salt is good, but if salt loses its flavor or its saltiness, how will it be seasoned? What is he saying salt is good? The salt here is that which preserves you. What preserves you? The word, the word is good. But if you don't let the word work in your life, if the word is not effective, it, the, it's lost its flavoring. It's lost its saltiness. All he's saying here as he concludes here is, have salt in your lives, have peace with one another. Let the word work in your life and get along. Love one another. That's all he's saying. 
And people that don't understand the Old Testament system of sacrifice with the fire and the salt, you don't understand why Jesus went there. The Jews listening to him would have understood exactly what he was talking about. And what he was saying for us in plain, simple English today, as we conclude this Friday night service for our youth conference and for our uh, 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 little flock con conference, let us remember this. Let the word be effective in your life. Let not your salt lose its saltiness. That which preserves you is the word. So make sure that you are constantly seasoned with salt that still has its flavor. Fancy language, let the word work in you. Let it have its perfect work in you that you may have peace one with another. I hope you got something out of this lesson today. Uh, perhaps we are a little more uh, redacted than we usually are, but Lord willing, uh, Sunday service will uh, uh, convene and you'll be further ad ad admonished in the Word of God and uplifted, hopefully. But do go back over these. Remember these three, uh, the four points, actually. Remember what we said earlier. First, that ambition is good, but have good ambition. Do that which is pleasing in the sight of God. And remember that to receive the seemingly unimportant or helpless one in, in society, in life in general, is receiving, helping, observing uh, God, respecting God himself, not just Jesus, God the Father himself. Number two, when someone is doing something in Jesus' name and it may not be familiar to you, if they do respect and honor Jesus, if they're not against us, count them as for us. Don't be so self-righteous to judge that they aren't doing it just like you, they don't sit with you, you don't know them. If they're honoring Jesus, back off, be a little patient. Also, the, the slightest service, the slightest ministry in the name of Jesus for someone else, the slightest, it's a good thing. The slightest service is a good thing. And the, and the fourth thing we learned today, or we're going over today, while he was still holding that little child in his hand, do not do anything that causes anyone else to turn from Jesus to stumble and make sure you are so severe on yourself in your lifestyle that what you do, where you go, how you think, see, is always going to be in the, in the, in the eyes of God something that is pleasing. That is to say it's going to keep you away from eternal destruction. God bless each and every one of you. I hope this word was uh, a help to you today. Continue to pray for one another, love one another, keep each other uh, first in your lives, learn to be last among the brethren. Learn to serve people in general. For whom? For the sake of Jesus. God bless each and every one of you. Today we've just gone over how to be a success in the eyes of God. You want applause of God or you want applause of men? I want the applause of God. God bless each and every one of you. Peace be unto you. Keep us all in your prayers as we pray for you in Jesus.